And stand by me would be uh, as well my motto for the next speaker, which is Dr. Lamis Baidun from the University Eye Hospital in Münster, Germany. Dr. Baidun, thank you for being with, us. being with us. Hello. Hello. Welcome from Münster. <laughs> I'm so pleased to come to us, especially in the prior session, we had some um, confocal microscopy from Perth, and we were speculating yeah. with what machine. I know the Australian guys quite well, and I'm pretty sure it's about the HRT RCM, where the uh, confocal microscopy has been performed. I don't know if you know these colleagues there. Anyway, um, we uh, are very pleased to present not only your presentation on HRT-RCM clinical application, but as well as you will see on your very last slide that we have your brand new application video online. Actually, the world was waiting for since a couple of weeks and now it's online, but I think you will tell us more. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm, I'm a bit puzzled. I don't see my slides yet. Okay, now that's coming on. So hello, everyone. My name is Lamis Baidun. I want to take the opportunity to first thank Heidelberg Engineering and the wonderful team around Dr. Stefan Schulz, who are doing a great team while preparing us for these presentations. So I was asked to talk about the HRT3 RCM, the clinical applications. And these are my financial disclosures. I'm trying to advance my slides, so now it's coming. And before I want to start, I actually would like to show you a little bit around the machine. And um, it has uh, quite some nice uh, features and it's quite easy to also handle it. So here you see, for instance, the chin rest and the height for the adjustment you can do with this scroll. And if you move further, then you find here a little button to capture your images. And uh, then you have three acquisition scrolls, screws that you see here. So these two are next to each other. The outer scroll moves the camera right and left. And the inner screw that you see with the next point is the one that moves it up and down. And finally, you have one important screw where you can advance the uh, camera towards your patient's cornea. And here on this one, you see the objective of the lens. So if I move on, uh, let's look a little bit more closely and uh, you can adjust these or achieve these high quality images by applying a little bit of gel on this lens here in the middle. And then you add a um, protective transparent cap on top of the lens. And before that, you have to, of course, um, give the patient some anesthetic and some gel to also improve the quality image. Finally, you can see here on the on the side the CCD camera, this is the camera where, which is uh, 90 degrees aligned to the anterior surface of the tomocap. And on the left side, you can see an acquisition window where you can monitor how far you are already away from the patient's cornea. And on this left side, you can capture or see the image you are um, at that moment or in the depth you are. Um, if you take Certain images you can use a 300 by 300 or a 400 by 400 image size, depending on the field lens you add to the microscope. So here you see um, the different um, possibilities of what you can image with a confocal microscope or the RCM, HRT3 RCM. Um, so you can see structures from the limbus, you see conjunctival structures, you can see even meibomian glands. And um, I will mainly focus here on the um, corneal structures that I've shown you here already on the right side with a little um, image of the confocal microscope. So if we now look at the difference between the confocal microscope and, for instance, the anterior segment OCT, you can extremely see 
how uh, what kind of structures or you can uh, clearly see how what structures you get with the anterior segment OCT you so you there get mainly an overview of the cornea with um, the limbus to limbus mainly uh, structures and it's very useful for instance to use it for uh, patients with um, after transplantation where you can see as you see in the lower image the detachment of the graft whereas with the confocal you can really see Cell cellular structures, and that makes the big difference. So before you start um, analyzing patients with the confocal microscope, it's also important to know the normal anatomical structures. So these normal structures are, for instance, shown here, from anterior to posterior, um, starting with the epithelium that is about 30 to 50 microns thick. And you have three different cell layers that you can visualize from superficial cells that are mainly having hyperreflective borders and um, uh, polygonal cell, sh cell shapes. Then you go to the middle cells that are wing cells that are mainly two to three layers. And those are also hyperreflective bordered, but the nuclei in contrast to the superficial cells are hardly visible. And finally, you have basal cells in the last uh, layer of the corneal uh, epithelium that are columnar and those um, are also hyperreflective in borders but more regular following the epithelium you normally see the subbasal uh, plexus and this is the area where also the bowman layer lies so this is the layer the acellular layer within the um, uh, corneal within the cornea that is normally not visible with the confocal after the uh, subbasal plexus, you can visualize the stroma. This is the compact part of the, of the cornea that makes about 90%. And as you see in this image here, the anterior stroma, stroma is normally packed with keratocytes that are sharply demarcated, highly re reflective. Normally, you don't see any cytoplasm like you see with the epithelium. Um, so this is the structure in the anterior that reduces, so the corneal keratocytes and nuclei reduce um, while you go to the posterior stroma that you see with this last image, before last image. And if you look at the nerves in the stroma, so the nor normally the cornea is a highly innervated um, structure, you can see the nerve endings here in the stroma. And finally, we move to the endothelium. This is the part of the, uh, st of the cornea that has hyporeflective borders and um, the cytoplasm is hyperreflective. In contrast to the normal anatomy that I've just shown you, you can see here a picture of a corneal uh, scar that's seen here with also with the anterior segment OCT and in the um, confocal image, you don't see any cells anymore. And interestingly, when you move to pictures like this, you can also, in contrast to the section images, so just single images that you take, take a movie. This movie can be on one plane, but also can be as a volume image uh, showing a depth of the structures you're seeing here. Interestingly, when you look at this left picture of a very ugly cornea the image in the confocal is so beautiful as you come when you compare this so besides those different acquisition windows that you can see like section images volume images and sequence images i'm trying to move forward you can also see other structures uh, or can have some information that you get with the confocal for instance here you can see in which area or which depth you are uh, circled in red in your window then you can also quantify the cells with the counting. And finally, you can also see um, immune cells or inflammatory cells. Here I show you some clinical applications with when you Google confocal microscopy and, and uh, cornea and eye, then you get uh, studies on drug toxicity, contact lens impact, infections, systemic diseases, inflammation, genetic diseases, there is a lot. I want to focus on corneal changes with the confocal where you can image ocular surface disease, corneal inflammation, limbus stem cell deficiency, um, corneal transplantation, um, 
nerve uh, imaging, keratocyte imaging, or infections, which we normally cannot differentiate between bacteria, but I will show you later what we, can, what we could if differentiate. I move forward. Like for instance, as you see here, the nerve ending alterations in studies, they look mainly as at uh, nerve branch densities, as redu at reduction of nerves, the, the regeneration of nerves, the repairing of nerves, the length and the alterations. This is very important, especially for systemic diseases like diabetes, Parkinson disease, but also after ocular surgery is very helpful to see how is the regeneration of nerves, like after keratoplasty, refractive surgery, or even QV cross-linking, where you can see a depletion of keratocytes, for instance, as well. And also in bacterial keratitis, dry eye disease, etc. So let's go to some examples moving a little bit uh, slowly. So I just told you that we cannot differentiate between the different bacteria, but what we can see is, for instance, acantamoeba. And the specificity and sensitivity are reported uh, diversely, but there is also some studies that report high uh, values. So if you see an image like this, you're sometimes not sure what is it. So if you do a confocal microscope, you could image those cysts of those uh, acantamoeba that are normally hyperreflective with a hyperreflective ring around it. Um, and so you could, before getting the result of a, of a swab or the culture or the PCR it, even, you could even already have an, a diagnosis with a confocal. When we look at um, fungal infections, like on this image, um, we have similar um, studies showing aspergillus or fusarium changes or changes of candida. These are, these are uh, fine hyperreflective lines that are visualized uh, with the confocal that can have a different angle of the branches. And therefore you could differentiate, for instance, aspergillus with 45 uh, degree angles from fusarium with 90 degree angles, degree angles from, the, from the branches that of this um, uh, fungi. It is important to identify with this machine the depth, for instance, and this helps you to um, monitor your treatment or advance your treatment or surgical intervention. And if I go to the next slide, I want to show you something which I do very frequently. This is about corneal um, keratoplasties uh, with DMAC, for instance. And here you see a patient with a, with a um, rejection. This these are images which you can take with the specular microscope, but you see only here some fine reflection on the specular image, whereas with the confocal, you can clearly see the inflammatory cells so that you can monitor also your treatment, as you see on the right, pic on the right picture, where those inflammatory cells are gone. The next example is a patient that was referred with um, uveitis and um, was not uh, reacting to topical steroids. From a clinical image, you could see that mainly this is, it looked like a, possibly a pseudofex exfoliation, but we confirmed it with a confocal because when here you again see the specula, which does not give you any information, whereas with the confocal, you see those hyperreflective um, islands that are not clearly not look like the ones I've just shown you, inflammatory cells or keratic precipitates. So this patient was had then a pseudo exfoliation syndrome, which had no where no treatment with steroids was necessary. An important point is also the endothelial dystrophies. Uh, you see here a patient with Fuchs dystrophy, sometimes you cannot really differentiate is it is it gute that he has at the endothelial level? Or is it other deposits? And he, again, with a specular, you see dark spots, which is normally typical also for a Fuchs disease, but with the specul with the confocal microscope, with the HRT3 RCM, you can see those elevations very clearly and can be sure that it's a Fuchs disease and not a pseudo-Fuchs or pseudo gute in this case. I have two more examples, I think. Let me see. No, one last one. This is my last example. It's the it's something we had in Münster, um, like a mass production of pine processionary caterpillars. In June 2019, we had like 
10 or 11 patients within two weeks coming as emergency seized with itching, redness, etc. And we could identify those fine lines uh, on the cornea. And uh, these hairs come from this butterfly or, and uh, were annoying to the patient. And they were very, very tiny visible. And I tried to actually visualize them with the confocal, but that was not possible. So I saw, I found a study where they were successful and then you can clearly see those spikes within the confocal microscope within this hair. And finally, with this, I would like to summarize that the HRT3 RCM is a non-invasive in vivo examination of the cornea. It requires quite some experience. I recommend you, when you start doing it, see a, a pathological structure. First of all, try to image some, some, uh, some healthy corneas. And if you don't, um, if you start to get familiar and, and secure with this machine, start also to image patients that have pathological structures. Don't give it to a technician that has not seen the clinical image because you have to correlate those images. And this will increase your experience and your understanding, for instance, that, that pigment deposits look like hyperreflective on a corneal endothelium, for instance. It's an additional tool, so it's not a standalone tool where you could think, um, I can already identify the diagnosis, so it helps you and it helps you to identify the disease a little bit earlier than if you would wait for uh, cultures, etc. So it gives you already a good indication uh, of what are you dealing with at that moment. So it helps you to visualize also subclinical findings, not only those that are, are really there. This is something, for instance, we did with DMAC that we saw patients with with uh, rejection having already cell changes on the level of the endothelium. So this could help you to visualize um, pathologies that are not yet really seen clinically. And finally, it helps you to monitor your treatment and to adjust your treatment. And with this, I would like to um, show you that we just recently have done this tutorial video together with Heidelberg Engineering a great team with Matthias uh, Bayford and the great camera and uh, the whole team that was there. We had really a lot of fun to uh, yeah, take this tutorial for you to show you, go through the whole uh, process, how give you some tips and tricks, how you could uh, yeah, learn quicker how to deal with this fantastic uh, machine that gives us in vivo images of the cornea that are so impressive when you haven't seen it before. Um, if you want to see this video, you just go to the QR code, for instance, or you see on the website of Heidelberg Engineering Academy, you find um, the tutorial video over there. I think it was online, as you said. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and hope I can take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Baidun, and thank you for doing the video with us. I hope now the download rates go up uh, because there was a lot of requests from all over the world how to do that, and now it's finally done. Thank you for that. We have uh, time for one question, and I would ask uh, in terms of uveitis and keratic precipitates, how can confocal microscopy help with HLR-B27 associated diseases? Um, BHLR27, well, actually, I must say, I see differences with, for instance, if you have, if you have uh, a Fuchs uveitis, so you could differentiate between those keratic precipitates. In HLA-B27, you have not these thick uh, granulomatous uh, keratic precipitates, whereas you have those in Fuchs uveitis, you have like stellate keratic precipitates, or for instance, in viral uveitis for CMV, you have all like shapes of the endothelium. So this can help you to differentiate between a, um, uh, fibrinous uveitis that you would have with HLA B27, where you can really clearly see that it's not this kind of uh, uh, keratic precipitate. Thank you so much. And again, uh, the call for the audience either visit the homepage where you find the download link, contact us, or maybe you secured the QR code. Thank you so much to Münster for this uh, very nice kickoff of the afternoon sessions.